Many thanks to Dr. Lee and to Dr. Richter. We'll move now into a half an hour set aside for questions for our speakers. Um, if you have a question, please move into one of the aisles and line up at the microphones we have set up there. And please uh, try to speak your question clearly into the mic. I would also ask you very kindly to try to restrain from giving a presentation of your own, um, but just to ask a question. Uh, when we're done with q and I'll make a couple of announcements and then we will break for lunch. So. If you want to be the first questioner, head for one of those mics. Hello. Maybe you can wait one minute oh. and let some yeah, of the sure. folks who are moving here do so. Please, go ahead. OK. Um, this is a question probably more for Dr. Richter. but. During your speech, you were talking about how um, within the context of the New Testament, people are empowered when they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And I was wondering if you think that, in the, um, that the New Testament claims that every believer is always filled with the Holy Spirit, or if that's somehow different than just being marked, with the, or marked by the Holy Spirit or sealed by the Holy Spirit for eternal life. And if those are two different things, what implications does that have for us as Christians? I, I would argue that the essence of the quality of life that we speak of as being born again is an infilling with the Holy Spirit. Um, I will defer to my actual theology colleague on this, but um, my uh, understanding of New Testament theology is that the Holy Spirit must regenerate, does regenerate, and is uh, the, the hallmark of what it means to be a Christian and to be a member of the new kingdom and the new lineage that is Jesus' uh, lineage. However, there is the additional reality of empowerment for activity. And of course, historically, there's a great debate on this. And the uh, great debate has much to do with our Pentecostal brethren. And when empowerment to serve occurs, uh, I would say that the New Testament claims empowerment to serve is the norm. It is regular. It is uh, the nature of the church. And that that empowerment uh, both is birthed in the regeneration moment, but there are also secondary experiences that come along. Um, secondary experiences of calling, transformation, deliverance, um, unique moments at which uh, the spirit chooses to act and you're the instrument he has chosen to act through. So I think my answer would be both and. I'm Presbyterian, so we don't talk too much about that second part, <laughs> but I have no major problem with what Dr. Richter said. Michael Welker, I have a question to uh, Professor Richter. Uh, thank you very much for your very strong presentation. You used the phrase, if I got it right, mm -hmm. illegitimate totality transfer. Yes. I liked it very much. Was it a quote or was it your phrase and what is the argument behind ah, it? It is, uh, a, first of all, thank you for saying my name with the appropriate accent and <laughs> I just enjoyed that. Um, all right. Uh, illegitimate totality transfer is a phrase that was coined by James Barr when he uh, took on much of the lexicographical method that had become rampant in biblical theology. And illegitimate totality transfer is this idea of, uh, in fact, we've all heard it from the pulpit at some point in time, uh, where we take one term out of scripture, we lift it, we go to the lexicon, we find out all of its meanings, and then anytime we encounter that term, we read all of those meanings back into it, failing to recognize that the function of speech is contextual and that all words come in sentences, which come in paragraphs, which come in documents. So James Barr, the semantics of biblical language would be where the phrase comes from. Here's my question. And 
I'm not sure if it is the fact that I didn't understand properly or what, but talking about the presence and the action of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament especially, what can we say about the Spirit's work outside of the tabernacle? Uh, outside of the what, I'm sorry? Tabernacle. Tabernacle, yes. Uh, the, uh, well, I, th I think uh, in the review of the prophets, the judges, the kings, we saw a great deal of activity outside the tabernacle. And that activity is specifically identified as empowerment. Uh, one, referring back to that first question, one of the debates of biblical theology is whether or not those individuals were being transformed in character by their empowerment as we see critical to New Covenant theology. Uh, so at, at some level, there does seem to be a divide between um, presence that transforms and empowerment that enables. Someone like Samson, for example, is troubled, invaded, uh, possessed of the Holy Spirit, uh, but I don't think his mother was very happy with him. <laughs> Perhaps my question wasn't complete. I know that the whole question of creation and spirit is coming tomorrow. But the question will be perhaps, what about the action of the spirit outside of the tabernacle, temple, or temple in Israel? Oh, so what so about the action of, creation, of the spirit in creation in all the nations, perhaps? So you're, you're looking for the wooing of the Holy Spirit among the nations? Well, not necessarily ruling, but the action or the work or mm -hmm. the presence. Mm -hmm. How is it that the Spirit works outside of this nation? Uh, two answers to that. One, I, I think that the trajectory of redemptive, redemptive history is the story of getting all of humanity back into relationship mm -hmm. with God. Therefore, mm -hmm. God's ambition from the dawn of time has been to win the nations. However, one of the particularities of our faith is that God, for reasons that still astound me, has chosen uh, only to work specifically through his people. That's the norm. Periodically, uh, Balaam and his donkey are, are called up to bat because no one else will, but it seems to me that the witness of scripture is that uh, God's ambition is to find, identify, and equip a people to represent him as witnesses to the nations and thereby bring the nations into his presence. My question is for Dr. Lee, um, specifically about uh, Basel saying there's one divine will. How does the incarnation serve as a resource for revealing that? I'm thinking specifically of Gethsemane and not my will, but yours be done. Do they speak to the incarnation specifically on the one divine will? Yeah, so this is sort of um, a couple of centuries later, but eventually there will be a debate over whether or not there is one will on the Son or two um, in Jesus Christ and the incarnation. And the affirmation was that when you're seeing something in Gethsemane, you are seeing a human will that's um, a function of the human nature wrestling with the divine will, which is indexed to the divine nature. And so the hypostatic union of Christ where he's one person, but both human and divine, this is a Chalcedonian formulation, so it's a fifth century formulation forward, um, legitimates two wills. So you really cannot read the Gospels and see that you know Jesus is sort of praying to the Father or that he's wrestling with the Father's will and so forth and project that into the Trinity itself um, because that's to confuse the economic Trinity imminent. It's to say that What's going on in Jesus in the incarnation can be sort of directly projected back into the Son's eternal relation to the Father. So that would be something that, um, yeah, that, that would be sort of a, a category distinction of the one will of, of God, you know, being initiated in the Father, proceeding through the Son, coming to completion in the Spirit, versus the human will that Jesus adopts um, in the humanity. This question is for Dr. Richter. Um, I recognize you had to move at an incredible blistering pace through all the history of scriptures and the Holy Spirit, but you, you point out something that's just interesting to me, and I, I wondered if you could comment on it. Um, 
your focus is on kings, leaders, fight, those who lead, fight, preach, uh, and you end up mentioning by name almost every single person who's mentioned in the Old Testament and New Testament by name is being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I don't think there's anything unique to your doing this, but that you skipped over the first person mentioned as being filled with the Holy Spirit in Scripture, who is Bezalel, uh, in Exodus 31, 35, and 36. Uh, and I'm just wondering, do you see a relationship between, or either symptom or cause, between even Protestant evangelicalism's kind of rejection of the arts in general, and mm -hmm. artists in particular, mm -hmm. uh, and the exclusion from Bezalel from our Holy Spirit Hall of Fame? Now, I realize this isn't where you were going. Dr. Wainwright and Dr. Young might deal with those tomorrow in terms of worship or creation. And they're not picking on you just for fun. <laughs> of ETS two years ago, I went around and just, in an unscientific survey, asked every single one of the greatest biblical and theological scholars in, in, in our midst, uh, who was Bezalel? Mm -hmm. And they scored less than 50% mm -hmm. that they could answer that question. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm on a five-year missionary journey teaching at Bethel and ministering among Christians and artists in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And this, is a, this sense of rejection from the mm -hmm. church especially the evangelical churches they were birthed in, um, is, is pretty deep. And I wonder if it's not rooted in our pneumatology. So I guess that's kind of my question. Why did you leave Bezalel out? And uh, what, is that a symptom or a cause of something mm -hmm. going on in our relationship with artists? Well, let me say that Bezalel is actually in the printed version of my presentation. Touche. Um, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I have actually published on Bezalel. Um, let me, so he was excluded just because I thought I was actually running short on time. And uh, he and uh, his colleague, uh, these are the fellows who are filled, and I don't think they're the first characters. I think Moses is spoken of as filled before they are. Actually, not with, that, not with Ruach Elohim. As a matter of fact, the only person mentioned that way is Joseph, but that's Pharaoh's description of him. Okay. So I'll it goes right from Genesis 1-2. First mention of Rocket, the next one is Bezalel. So it's pretty important. I will, I will <laughs> trust you on that. Although I'm going to pull up my Bible works when I get back to my office. Um, I just pulled my computer up to make sure I was right. So. All right. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, one of the reasons that uh, these two are often separated out is because their work is, is unique in that they are filled with the spirit of wisdom for art and uh, creative task. And I had wanted to bring this book up, so I'm now um, giving a just a, a blatant commercial, Presence, Power, and Promise. It's actually on special out at the, temp, uh, at the tables. This is a wonderful collection of essays on the spirit in the Old Testament. And there is an essay on here on your two heroes uh, by none other than Rick Hess. Uh, and one of his points is that uh, Bezalel and, oh, I can never say his name, oh, Ochelayov, um, are uh, empowered due to, I, I did make this statement, they already have a certain skill set that is augmented by the Holy Spirit, and their skill set is for art and carving and decoration, and they are the ones who make the tabernacle the amazingly visual, impactful place that it is, uh, and yet the Holy Spirit comes upon them to make that above and beyond what their own skills as artists are able to accomplish. Uh, Hess makes the argument that one of the reasons that they needed the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is they're not just making any building, they're making the tabernacle. And, and I love that, I think that's very powerful. So back to the sense of estrangement of the artistic world, I think one source of that, a major source of that, is the aniconic theology of the Old Testament. You shall not make an image but we have traditionally mistranslated image over and over and over again, and this is why we all need to get PhDs in the ancient Near Eastern <laughs> literature of the Hebrew Bible. The word image is not simply image. It is Salmu in the Akkadian. It is Tselem in the Hebrew. It is an idol. And if you were any one of Israel's neighbors and you heard the word Tselem, you would not hear artwork. You would hear animated incarnation of a deity. 
That's what you would hear. And the Ten Commandments command not that artwork is forbidden, but that making animated incarnations of other deities is forbidden because Yahweh has already made his selim, and it is you. Um, I'm sorry, this is another question for Dr. Richter, although I would be happy to hear Dr. Lee uh, address it as well. Um, in your presentation, you went uh, in almost a symmetrical way from uh, there's only one person, only one day of the year uh, who gets uh, access to the Holy Two uh, after the Incarnation. Everyone uh, has access uh, to the Holy. Uh, and in making your transition, you talked about how we are the temple. Um, and you may have uh, alluded to it, but you didn't say much about the fact that uh, it's a plural, you, and it's, it's, it's a y'all. And so um, I wonder what you would say about the fact that it's not just individuals, mm -hmm. even if it's overlooked artists, but it's all of us that uh, now um, have have the holy together, and, mm -hmm. and what are the implications for that? Uh, well, that's where I think the phrase where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. Uh, this, is, this is what Jesus is alluding to, this corporate sense. We are now living stones being built up together into a holy edifice in order to offer spiritual sacrifices, uh, that we are the gathering place. I do believe that the individual is the temple as well, and Paul makes the kind of corporate individual argument going back and forth in the book of Corinthians. Jesus himself, of course, first claims the status I am the temple, tear this down, and in three days I'll rebuild it. So, you know, there's, there's this back and forth between individual and corporate, between the unique incarnation that is the Christ and then his church. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that there are many, many nuances in there that I have not captured be, between those things. But I think the implications can be gathered from the Old Testament. What did the temple do? You know, the temple housed the presence. Why did the temple house the presence? So that the people of God could be marked as unique by the fact that the presence was with them. As Moses said, if you don't go with us, I'm not going. Uh, so, you know, this unique identity, we marked by the presence, filled with the presence, and then what is our function? To stand as a testimony to the nations of who God is and what he has done, and uh, ultimately uh, to bring it to the very practical point if sinner and saint cannot be sure that when they enter, um, you know, First Baptist or Third Presbyterian or Gary United Methodist, that they're going to encounter the almighty presence of God, then that church is failing at, it, at its task. Is that what you, those sorts of things you're asking? Okay. Greg, do you want to comment on especially the corporate versus the individual? No, I don't have anything to add to that. I just wanted to say that I did actually quote um, Exodus 31 in Basel and the arts and so forth. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not an Old Testament scholar. <laughs> um, Dr. Lee, I was um, curious, not being nearly as familiar with De Trinitate as you are, um, and the, um, your explanation of the relationship of the spirit and how um, Augustine specifically formulates that. I was curious if you could expand on how he preserves the distinction between spirit and son, given that you were talking about how those two roles and the missions are so um, deeply intertwined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, I guess, two levels of that question. We might start with um, the more earthy one with redemptive history and what you see in scripture and so forth, which is that the mission of the son obviously is in the incarnation. And then the spirit, Augustine wrestles with exactly when the spirit is given, primarily Pentecost, but you also have this instance at the end of John where Jesus breathes on his disciples and says, receive the spirit. So in terms of time, the, the sending of the son happens prior to the sending of the spirit. So the son is sent in the incarnation, the spirit comes to sort of complete the work of the son. And the way that Augustine is understanding um, their interaction with regard to salvation is to say that the incarnation involves 
a permanent union between humanity and divinity in the person of Jesus Christ in a way that's different from what you see with a spirit who might come down in the form of a dove or might come down in the flames of fire and Pentecost and so forth. But doesn't, you don't talk about sort of um, like the divine and fiery nature or the divine and dove-like nature of the spirit's you know, mission, whereas you do talk about the divine and human natures of Christ. So Christ is sort of a visible you know, union of humanity and divinity that directs us from things that you can see to things that you can't see, namely the divinity of Christ, whereby he just is co-equal to the Father. And then the question, whereas the Spirit is the one who sort of enables you to perceive that as you respond positively to the example of humility in Christ, as you see what Christ has done for us, this bridge of sorts, this mediator between God and humanity, the spirit is the one who sort of liberates you internally to um, receive Christ's uh, um, sending. So in that sense, the spirit is sort of internally doing the same sort of thing that the external work of Christ was intended to do. Then the other level of the question is sort of, well, what does this mean in terms of the spirit's relation to the son before the creation of the world before time and space and anything like that. And that's an issue which I alluded to at the beginning of my paper and also at the end, where the, the, if you say that the Son is begotten of the Father eternally and the Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father, then basically what you're saying is that there's some relation of unity, dependence, identity between the Son and the Father, which we'd call eternally begetting. So the Son comes from the Father in such a way that the Son is identical to the Father, but this doesn't happen in time. It's not like the Father exists, and then after a little while, the Son comes to exist. Procession seems to mean sort of the same thing. And so what's the difference between the Son and the Spirit? And in the fourth century, um, in quite a variety of really important figures, they really wrestle with this question. You'll see in Gregory of Nazianzus, you know, what exactly is eternal beginning? It's a mystery. What exactly is the procession of the spirit? It's a mystery. And he just sort of leaves both at that, but says they're both different. What Augustine is trying to do is give you a little bit more conceptual work um, to play around with to say that the, the sort of rock image will picture gives the spirit a kind of unique role in the Trinity that's outside of time and space that indicates that the spirit in some way comes from the father and the son without being identical to the son. So you sort of begin with the idea that the Son is sent in time in the Incarnation, the Spirit is sent um, in time in Pentecost, primarily, um, to sort of apply the work of the Son, and then you sort of reason back and say, if the Son comes from the Father eternally, and the Spirit comes from the, uh, the Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son in time, you can project that back into the eternal God, and then how exactly you distinguish between the Spirit and the Son, and then you have the sort of rock, image, will example that we used. Actually, you, I think you pretty much answered the question I was going to ask. But I, I often hear contemporary defenders of the filioque clause saying things like, well, um, the spirit illuminates the father and the son, or the spirit is the bond of the father and the son. Mm -hmm. And it just seems that's, that's talking more about what the spirit does and less about the father and the son the spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. So I was just wondering if you would have a, um, if you think Augustine, I think you're saying, by the way, you just answered that, Augustine is making a very kind of a clear distinction between the two in his uh, defense. Do you mean between the Son and the Spirit, or between? Uh, in terms of the, the language of procession and origination, saying that the Spirit, um, uh, that the, spirit originates, proceeds from both the Father and the Son, mm -hmm. I think is very different, and this is what I would like you to comment on, than saying that the Spirit illuminates the Father and the Son, or the Spirit is the bond of the Father and the Son, which is often what I hear defending uh, the filioque clause, especially in a lot of contemporary theology. Because I think the language, the problem with the language that I think is confusing is the origination and the procession mm -hmm. language. So. Yeah, it's definitely a mystery um, that both sides, East and West, really wrestle with. And at the end of, you know, 450 pages of Augustine's De Trinitate says, there's been this basic issue that I haven't really been able to figure out through my whole text, which is what's the difference between the Son being begotten of the Father and the Spirit's procession? 
I mean, he says, I really don't get this myself, and this is just the best effort that I'm going to give you. And so, um, yeah, this is a problem that vexes early Christian interpretation. In terms of illumination, um, I take Basel to be talking more about God's activity in time, where he's saying that the Spirit helps us to perceive the Son, who's the image of the Father. So that's sort of a different kind of thing than the bond of love between the Father and the Son. Augustine does hold to, um, he, he is sort of an important source of the filioque clause, and he does hold very strongly and distinctively that the spirit is a bond of love between the Father and the Son. And the way that he understands it is that, um, sort of what we were talking about before, that the spirit is um, sort of, well, the way that he sort of talks about the filioque clause, or the, the basic idea is that the Father is the source of all divinity, which is something that the East really wants to stress. And then the Father has given it to the Son that the Spirit can proceed from the, from the Son in addition to the Father. So there is a kind of primacy on the Father. The Spirit doesn't proceed from the Father and the Son in the same way. Um, he proceeds sort of derivatively from the Son, but primarily from the Father. And then the best sort of human example that he can do, that he can produce to sort of explain that is to sort of talk about the spirit as this desire or this will or this love, and he's drawing there on scriptural language that particularly identifies the spirit with love. So hopefully that's helpful. Sorry if uh, it's still confusing. Uh, in the two very good papers, I heard two different things potentially going on and what's happening behind Old Testament theophany. And I just wondered if Dr. Lee, maybe to start, or the two of you would like to interact on what Augustine is saying is happening there when we see God's presence in the Old Testament and what we heard in our Old Testament paper. Yeah, so Augustine um, has an interesting view, which is that the Old Testament theophanies are the work of angels. Um, he really wants to create a kind of distinction between um, the sendings of the Son and the Spirit and what you see in the Old Testament because he wants to say that there really is a difference between the Old and New Testaments in that in the New Testament, the Son is sent for the first time in a really decisively redemptive way. And so that means that he wants to sort of downplay um, the degree to which, and, and by the way, there's people before him who do identify the Old Testament theophany as basically with the second person of the Trinity with the pre-incarnate Christ. And Augustine is not making that move. And he's drawing on that, uh, he's drawing um, for that position on scripture itself, where in Genesis 22, for instance, it's the angel of the Lord who tells Abraham not to sacrifice Isaac. Or it says that the law is delivered through angels. That's something that you see in Galatians. Or in Hebrews 1 and 2, there's this contrast set forth between angels and the son. You know, to what angel did he ever say, you will be my son um, and I will be your father? Well, then in Hebrews 2 at the beginning, that's chapter 1 of Hebrews, chapter 2, the first four verses, it says that um, the law was, you know, mediated through angels, and how much more must we be careful if we violate this covenant of the Son? So he does want to distinguish between the Old Testament theophanies and what you see with the revelation of the Son in the Incarnation, and he's drawing upon a wide range of scriptural evidence in both Old and New Testaments to advance that claim. I know little or nothing about Augustine, um, but what I did very much like about Dr. Lee's paper is that he is uh, making, that Augustine is making the statement that we can't necessarily tease one of the persons of the Trinity out of any of these theophanies. I'm deeply appreciative of that because I, I stand in the same boat, you know, uh, teasing out uh, distinction uh, is beyond our scope. Um, and in particular, as we move to the New Testament, there are certain visions that are reiterated that are identified as Christ. Uh, so we have this interaction uh, with Isaiah having seen Yahweh enthroned, and yet, if I'm not mistaken, the New Testament speaks of that as a Christophany at a certain point. And of course, Isaiah would not have thought of that as a Christophany, and he is seeing uh, the the Godhead enthroned. Um, I, I actually find Meredith Klein very helpful on, on this particular point. His spirit cloud, for any of you who were educated by Meredith Klein, his, his vocabulary is distinctive, peculiar, and elaborate, uh, but that's how he gets all of his theology into a single phrase. 
And his glory spirit cloud, if you have gotten through Kingdom Prologue, all of his volumes, uh, what he essentially sees is that the Holy Spirit is um, almost the uh, diplomat sent into the foreign country. We are the foreign country. And when the finger of God, the hand of God, the force of God invades this foreign dimension, it is the glory spirit cloud. And from a distance, it looks like cloud, wind, and fire. As you get closer, you realize it's theophanic. If you actually catch a glimpse of the inner recesses, you will see the Lord high and lifted up and throned upon uh, within his temple and the cherubim and the seraphim. And that's why wings are so often associated with the glory cloud. I don't know if that's helpful, but... That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I think we should have time for the three questions that are standing if we go quickly. Um, I have a question about the Holy Spirit at work in my life today. Um, years ago, I read the little volume called They Found the Secret by Ed, J. Raymond Edmond. I think, I think I'm pronouncing his name wrong. He used to be the president here at Wheaton College. And it was a series of essays originally appeared in Christianity Today, and it was about people who were missionaries or they had full-time workers in ministry and how they were kind of floundering and burning out and, and, and trying to do the work on their own. And then they had the infilling of the Holy Spirit and then their missionaries, their mission work flourished in their work. In, but I thought that when I became a Christian, I would have the Holy Spirit at, indwelling on, with me then. And they were already Christian, so what happened? I don't understand what you know what went on in that oh, in their life in their ministry. Well, they didn't they have the Holy Spirit when they be, first became a Christian, and then what happened so that then their ministry took off and explain that. I'll give you the opportunity to give a Pentecostal answer I'm, if you want. I'm, I'm waiting for my <laughs> Presbyterian colleague to give his answer. <laughs> I'll give the simpler answer, and then she'll complicate it with like the second thing. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that, I would agree with what Dr. Richter said earlier, that um, the indwelling of the Spirit is a mark of being a Christian. Mm -hmm. That's really something that's transformative. It's distinct for just being um, empowered for certain kinds of particular services. Um, though we do see that throughout the, the Old Testament and so forth. That said, I don't think that um, the sort of living presence of the Spirit is necessarily felt in the same way at every moment of the Christian life and that it's possible to go through ups and downs and moments of um, serious discouragement, either through um, external forms of suffering or sort of, you know, internal issues that you're wrestling with or, you know, sin issues um, that make the spirit sort of less palpably felt, um, to use sort of, you know, physical language. Um, than at other times when it is possible to re receive this sort of rejuvenation. I think also through the history of the church, you see moments of revival, times when the church is going you know, through real darkness and moments when it just seems like the spirit moves in and major conversions happen. There's a real joy and holiness that didn't exist. There's a real empowerment for ministry that didn't exist. So I wouldn't take those things to be contradictory. I think you can affirm the presence of the Holy Spirit within Christians, even if they're struggling, but also affirm that there's other moments when the Spirit comes in fuller power. I, I would also comment that I think the, uh, the great challenge of the Christian life is abiding in the vine, right? And uh, regardless of what your views on secondary work of grace secondary works of grace might be, uh, the, the challenge to abide in the vine and actually be an instrument for God in building his kingdom as opposed to that good, solid Protestant work ethic that if I just pedal faster, the kingdom will come. Um, I, that's, that, that's a great challenge, I think, to all of us. So now to, to move beyond that reality, which I would think is part of our our salvation, our soteriological experience, um, the Wesleyan tradition, which starts certainly with John Wesley and then moves on through the holiness revivals into the Church of God, the Assemblies of God, the Pentecostal movement, would claim that secondary works of grace are indeed normative for 21st century Christians. And they were normative in the first century and they should be normative now, where there would be debate within the church. Uh, about that. 
a standard Wesleyan position is that there, there are secondary works of grace that empower and transform, and that those, they would interpret those missionaries as having come to one of those junctures where the Holy Spirit says, um, I, I want to push you further up and further in, uh, to quote C.S. Lewis, um, and uh, empower you further, transform you further. Um, some would call this entire sanctification. Some would call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but ultimately, it results in a believer who is more surrendered to the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, not uh, some, t some of our brethren would interpret that as transformative of character. Others would push, like the Assemblies of God, much more towards strict empowerment. Um, there are people here who need to get healed. I'm going to use you as that instrument, and the Holy Spirit is going to speak and work through you. Uh, so I would, I would an anticipate that would be the diagnosis of what happened with those missionaries. Okay, thank you. And we are at time, so apologies to the two folks waiting.